Welcome everyone to chapter eight, congruency. And I actually, congruency changed my whole life, independent of body whispering, because I spent my whole childhood not understanding why I always felt so weird when some people talked. And my mom would, when she got upset, she would stand in the kitchen singing angrily. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I don't, I don't understand why she would be singing if she was angry, but she wouldn't say that. So this whole idea of that people are not necessarily congruent energetically with what comes out of their mouth completely changed the way I navigated the world. I don't know what it was like for you, Chenin, but that was like one of the biggest revelations ever for me. Well, recognizing the congruency thing, and I love how Dane actually, Dane is the one that put that term, I would say, mm -hmm. is where I learned that term. Um, that it really, it really saved my sanity because for so long, I thought I was crazy because I couldn't, I didn't realize what was going on, but I spent uh, the majority of my life before the tools of access being really angry. And we all know that one of the things that one of the five elements of anger is when there's a lie yeah. <clears throat> and so I would just be angry like I mean I was like the anger was like really ruining my life because it was like all the time and I couldn't stand to be around people and I was just like constantly angry and I could never solve it or handle it until finally I started learning about this congruency thing and and my dad would point out like look are they saying one thing and out of their mouth and then saying a different thing out of their head and I was like omg that's what's going on I'm just picking up on I'm hearing what's true for everybody but not from their mouth everything that was coming out of their mouth was you know and so now instead of being instead of being totally reactive and at the effect of which is where the anger would come into play. Now I can recognize, well, this person is not at all saying what's real and true for them, but it doesn't need to be my problem anymore. Yeah, yeah. And, and also one of the things that in the chapter, Dane talks about it when you work on people, which I think is so brilliant. He says, um, I underlined it, of course. Um, are they willing to have what they're asking for and is it the time for them to have what they're asking for? Because so often I find that it's not, they may even say what they, they may even like what comes out of the mouth. Sometimes they don't even know that it's not congruent, right? Sometimes we don't know that we're not congruent for what we're saying. And sometimes there's this time aspect where we're starting to become aware of something and we're starting to become congruent with something, but we're not entirely there it's like the awakening of that energetic congruency and that also because the more aware you become of this energetic congruency part the more the subtleties of it actually comes and if you work with bodies that's one of the things that will come more and more and more like that energetic congruency what they're willing to receive not only what they're saying, but what they're actually energetically willing to receive. Yeah, and that's where we then makes it easiest for easier for us not to fall into the trap because how many of you guys have believed what somebody said and then tried to give them that and then they returned it back to you with daggers attached because that's what people do when you give them something they don't want to receive. You know, I think we're all, we've all fallen into that trap. And the funny part is they, they, the anger with the dagger attached comes even if they said they wanted that, because if they're not congruent with that, exactly. it doesn't matter exactly. what they said at all. It doesn't, so they essentially, say, yeah. essentially, the congruency is like breaking the code, like the weird, crazy mystery of this reality. It's like the thing that makes what has never made sense before all of a sudden you've broken the code like now you can see what's true sometimes not all the time hopefully some of you guys have you guys i'm seeing with a lot of your heads nodding that you have experienced this thing where you believe what somebody said and then you delivered that and then it didn't work like we've experienced that a lot so it's like we've all fallen into that trap I mean, and I, the thing that I actually find the most, to be perfectly honest, it's the most sort of profound and 
empowering and sort of the most magic about the congruency thing is when we use it on ourselves. Yeah. So in the book, Dane's, you know, in the book, Dane's talking obviously about working with other people, which is totally relevant. But what started to occur for me was when I could actually be, and I'm going to say honest with myself, Mm. because that is an aspect of congruency. Um, You can really only be congruent when you're being honest with you. So when I started to be really honest about what I was choosing, what I desired, what worked and what didn't work, even if it didn't match my points of view about what should be occurring, then and only then when you become congruent through honesty with self, when you become congruent through self-honesty, then and only then do you create this harmony and synergy through which all the molecules in the universe can adapt and actualize to that ask. When you're incongruent, you're always slightly out of tune. And so any energy and any molecular connection to that ask, that incongruent ask, never can form properly because everything's askew. So nothing can really form. But when you get into congruency with yourself, by being honest, by acknowledging what is, I think that's another way of putting it. My dad says that a lot, just is, acknowledge what is. Um, that's, when the, that's when you access magic. And until then, you're not. You're in hopes and dreams, projections and expectations. And this is also why the secret doesn't work. Like things like the secret, because it's it's like you can ask the law of attraction. The law of attraction. The law of attraction doesn't work. The secret. It's like what secret are we talking about? No, no. Before access, I watched this movie called The Secret, and it never worked for me, and it seemed to work for everyone else. And that was like a a law of attraction book. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's that and. Somebody called TL was asking, what if you don't know where you're hiding or incongruent? Well, basically what Shannon is saying that is so like the willingness to be brutally honest with yourself is really, it's a choice. And then you practice that. And I can hear yeah. now when I'm not congruent with myself, I hear it come out of my mouth and I'm like, it just sounds like blah from me. Yeah. Can I speak to that thing? Like, how do you know when you're not being congruent with yourself more? Like, I have to be, I have to say something about this knowing thing straight up front. What's true is that you can't not know. Mm. And what occurs is you're raised, or it's like, were you raised in a household that acknowledged knowing, that looked for what was known? or in a household that invalidated knowing or didn't acknowledge knowing. You know, knowing is a muscle. And like Kat said, it's something that when you, the more you practice it, the easier it gets. And I have also experienced that 100%. So what's true is that you can't not know. You know, full stop. Is there anything an infinite being wouldn't know? So that thing about knowing, you know, that thing about knowing is such a huge um, cornerstone in whether you're going to access more consciousness or be a leaky vessel that never sustains the growth of awareness. Because the more you do I don't know, the more you literally diminish and deplete the muscle of knowing, the more you practice and exercise the muscle of knowing, like, what do I know? So like when I'm confused, right? Like for example, oh, let me give an example. Max and I right now are in Brittany, France. We flew in yesterday to look at a property here, a 90 acre property that's got like three old farmhouses, like stone ruins and like, it's like a lot. (laughs) It's good, there's a lot going on. And we're in France and in this part of France, it's really just a lot of French, like no English. Like really they refuse to speak English with me. Anyways, it's so this morning I'm like, okay, what are we doing here? Like, this is a lot. And then it's like, and I'm like, okay, wait. So I could go into all the reasons why this is difficult. And I can go into all the reasons for why this is going to work. Or I could just follow the energy and listen to that whisper. And so obviously the body whispering book is listening to the whispers of the body, but that really translates into every aspect of our Mm -hmm. lives. And like, when I just ask the land, if I just ask the energy, like, is this 
a yes. I just get yes. Like it's just, it's so light. It just goes. Yeah. And that's the whisper. I can't, I can't determine how on God's great earth am I going to deal with this property in a country where I do not speak the language with archaic French taxes and archaic French like building laws. I'm like every reason, every, every grain of logic in my world is saying, are you sure you want to do this? But if I listen to the whisper, it's a, it's a, and that goes so much to Sandra was asking, what about congruency with healing with the body? And so much of what we do is like go to the logic or go to the investment in the mm. outcome. Like I am going to heal my body, therefore. And then at the moment, you actually lose what Shannon is describing, that whisper that may go against everything you've decided is required, for example, to heal or all of so this is where. And the, and the whisper is also never, oh, this is, I think, the other really frustrating thing about the whisper is it's like never solid. It's not like the whisper is necessarily this thing you can, this concrete thing you can rely on later. It's like a whisper. It changes like yeah. the wind. Yeah. So it's not the conclusion that's going to make everything right. It's like this gift of this like <laughs> sparkle off in the distance that you can follow. Do you know where it's going to lead? No way. But it's such a good description. It's like the wind because the wind comes, goes, changes directions all the time. So if you're willing to actually go with the wind, you also have to be willing to like go with that dance. And sometimes the wind disappears for a while and you don't, you know, you're waiting. You, I was going to say, well, you don't when know. You, <laughs> but when you, when you, when you learn through practice, through acknowledging your knowing, and through acknowledging your awareness, you can learn to harness the wind and yeah. harness the whispers. Just like we see all of the windcraft work around Europe, all of the windmills that are generating energy. Yeah, sometimes they're standing still because the wind stopped, but somebody listened and observed long enough to determine where that energy was. And then they put a device to harness that energy. And that's what's so brilliant about being body whisperer or a awareness whisper at all is if you observe long enough you know where you can substantiate greater awareness or greater energy or access greater possibility by observing the whispers and that's kind of the answer to praga that's your answer to your question there and she was asking how does one get to the point where they can be this easily aware of the whisper mm -hmm. well how um, many years did it take you kat Oh, I'm still working on it and I'm on my 12th year. Me too. Year and, yeah. and me too. And I would say I've, I've been pretty wholeheartedly committed to this for 22 years. Yeah. And I'm still, I mean, I'm still remembering like, oh yeah, I'll send the whispers. Like it's, you know, I still even can be susceptible to conclusion and linearity. And, and I think one of the things both with congruency and listening to the whispers is that it also goes back to this not being right or wrong because the with since the whispers and since congruency none of those gives you a right answer you can't like now this person is this because that's what you concluded in your congruency test you know it's that's not what this really it is this awareness is not like a solid or heavy, like a conclusion. Awareness is fleeting, like the wind. It gives you information and then, you know, it moves and it changes and it shifts. So I think one of the things also, Pragwat, is the willingness to not search for the right or wrong choice or the right and, and wrong to even know when you are searching for the right or yeah. wrong thing. Yeah. To even be able to recognize you're looking for an answer. Yeah. Um, Can I just say something about? Yeah. It's interesting listen, watching where this conversation is going, and the best definitely about the whispers, because something that to recognize, I, it, I've observed a lot over time when we have conversations about more consciousness or using the tools of access, awareness, etc. Something that you guys probably might want to, I don't know if this helps but to look at that this is a new language that we're talking about. And Jane wrote this book that's actually about teaching you a new language. 
Yeah. And so it's very tempting to try to fit this new language into the language of this reality that we already know and utilize very well, like conclusion and definition and logic and reason. That is logic, reason, definition, conclusion is a language. We are masters of that language in this reality. We're taught it so well from, you know, day one. But right now we're talking about a new language. And can you guys actually sense that this language as Kat and I talk, can you sense this palpable and this palpable mm, quality that's existing now with all of mm. us? Can anyone sense that? Deb, Stacy, me, Deb, Stacy, and okay, a couple, a couple, a couple. Okay, cool. That's actually the quality of this language of energy, the language mm. of awareness. And awareness is a different language, it's the language of perception whispers, being, knowing, question. Those are the qualities and um, access points for learning the vocabulary of awareness. And what everything that Dane does is within the vocabulary of awareness. So the whole body whispering book is a, a manual for a new language with body. It's a new language. So I think you, we need to remember that. And also that language, then it's kind of like, so I often find that my body teaches me so many things about awareness. Mm -hmm. It's like my mm -hmm. body is more aware than me in many ways. So this body is like taking that route into awareness. You can learn that language through your body, or you can learn it another way. It None, none excludes the other. And this is like one entry point of learning that language that Shannon is talking about. And for me, it's really helped since I'm such a mindy, brainy person to allow the body awareness to kind of lead me into more awareness in the rest of my life. And so how do you get congruent? Yeah. How do you acknowledge when someone, including you as the someone is being congruent? You know, it's like by being sensitive to the energy like and actually acknowledging when you perceive when something goes weird and that's mm -hmm. I actually I actually think that one of the things that contributes to us like you guys know when it's like something goes heavy and then it just stays heavy for like 15 years like and it's like never addressed or it could be five days or it could be 45 minutes I mean I know that the more I've learned the language of energy and the more I have actively chosen to use the tools of access, the less long the heaviness lasts. I'm able to be like, okay, something just went super weird. And then I use my tools, I ask the questions and I follow the energy to the change. And what creates the change is being coming congruent with the awareness I just had that I didn't acknowledge that I had. And that takes practice, but it takes also the willingness to acknowledge the qualities of energy. And we're not really taught to acknowledge the qualities of energy. In fact, mostly when we're little, when we're aware of energy, like when we're, for example, I believe a lot of babies cry and are upset because they're perceiving what's going on in the world around them or with the adults around them, but the adults aren't turning to the child and being like, thank you so much for showing me what the energy I'm creating in the world right now. Let me, thank you for this reflection. Let me see if I can shift this energy, right? Mostly the people with the upset turn towards the children and say, what's wrong with you? So then we then are taught that everything that we perceive that's heavy or crazy or weird is a problem with us. Mm. And that's the step. That's the first step on the path to not knowing. That's awesome. That's brilliant. Um, and one of the things that also popped for me, when I started to use the access tools, um, there was, for example, this tool, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. What can I do to make up for the damage done that you can use in all kinds of situations? And at that time, a lot of people started to use that around, but just in words, and it just pissed me off. <laughs> more right they're faking they're like i'm yeah. gonna tell you like, the line i know i'm supposed exactly. to say 
So this is also, this is one of the most amazing parts of the access tools is if you're actually congruent with them, they work. <laughs> if you're not, they may work to a certain extent, but you haven't even touched how they can work if you're actually being congruent. So saying, what can I do to make up for the damage done while really saying, fuck you in your head is not gonna create the same effect if you're actually willing to be that energy of what mm -hmm. can I do to make up for the damage done. So this is like, we're, we're talking about, when we're talking about congruency and whispering of energies, we're talking about how to be the tools, I think, in a different, way than we usually do well, that's why i chose but that's why i chose the congruency section because mm -hmm. i actually believe that if you get if you can get congruent with yourself first i don't know i'm not even really sure you can be congruent with others or recognizing when others are congruent if you're not really congruent with you I, maybe I, actually i'm not sure i do know that when you're congruent with you I, I do know that congruency with yourself, meaning honesty with self, is like the most powerful transforming energy. It's most people walk around for a really large degree, not really questioning anything, but then in addition, like choosing things that don't work for them. Mm. And if everybody just started choosing like what worked for them, like literally the reality would change. Like so many of the strongholds of upset and difficulty and like what maintains the limitations of reality would just disappear because so, mm. so it's such a powerful, I, I think that, that congruency is like a real stronghold and that's how it, lack of congruency or lack of honesty with self or lack of knowing is how this reality maintains its ruse and if you do know what you know then i guess lies have no power anymore you know i'm wondering also um so if if your if your desire is consciousness or more congruency people who are congruent with themselves tend to for me at least they tend to relax me and they also tend to inspire me to choose more look more be more like and what i find is that people get really nervous if if they are lying a lot to themselves they get really nervous around people and very like like terrified by them because there's so they, it actually brings up that sense of it, it brings up their awareness to that sense of lie in themselves, I think. What do you get? I don't know. I like barely pay attention to that kind of stuff. <laughs> I get well, that could told be true. a lot. I get told a lot that I'm scary. So maybe that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about like people's reaction, for example, to Gary and Dane and to you too, too as well, where they find you like terrifying. Mm. And, I, and for me, I used to find Gary terrifying. And part of that was that I always thought that he would see the lie that I thought I was being in the world. And Did once you know that? Oh yeah, I got to it finally. I used to be so terrified by Gary. But, and then, but did you know that it was because you thought he'd see the light? Not until after years and years. Not until after you actually got free of it. Like yeah. first you yeah. got free, then you realized yeah. what the yeah. source of that was. Totally. Yeah. For years, I just thought like I was intimidating or shy or just whatever, whatever reason. Or so something was wrong. And yeah. that was probably something, you. Yeah. And it was all, yeah, yeah it was all me. And, and then once I got out of that, I could look back and I could see that's why I wasn't congruent with myself at all. So I kept thinking that somebody would discover who I truly was, like somewhere behind there. That but without I, even really knowing that that's what you were reacting yeah, to. Yeah, without yeah. even, and, and now I, I don't have that. It's like gone now. So yeah. now that's not there anymore. And that part, I think, is like, I think, yeah, the, that freedom. When, I think the yeah. freedom is what I'm after. That comes from not having to be terrified that somebody's going to discover the congruency with yourself actually starts to create that. 
Well, others can only, you know, I mean, there's so many, uh, it's like how much, how, when, okay, where do I go? The, when, I mean, you use Gary as an example, it's like, the thing to recognize is like congruency is a particular vibrational expression. Yeah. So when you're congruent, you're like emitting that zone. That's the quality of your zone. And then all molecules that interface and interact with that zone of congruency either adjust to it or have to reject it. And like, so for example, with Kat, it's like she would enter into Gary's like zone of congruency and her lack. So the the vibration and the lack of congruency would start like getting really weird until she finally submitted to adjusting to congruency. And that's, and so, but that's, but this is the thing where that a lot of us are going to, that a lot of you probably already have run into this, whether you realize it or not, it's like, how many people have reacted aggressively or poorly towards you when you start becoming more congruent with you and Mm -hmm. as you, you know, my husband, my husband's family is like fucking psychotic when he became himself. They were like, you get back in your box, you bad, bad man. (laughs) And I was like, babe, if you get back in that box, I'm leaving you forever. So it was like, you know, we have the, a lot of people around us, people who we actually deeply care for and have a big influence on our lives can be anti-congruency. And it's just to recognize that there can be that, um, that force against congruency that will come from external sources, but does it really, and this is where you, this is where you need to be really honest with yourself about what works and what you really wanna choose and create. Yeah, this whole, yeah, I, that was such a good description, Shannon, with this, this zone of congruency. Um, There's a lot of comments um, in there. I would also say that intimidation is not always a wrong or bad thing. Intimidation is when you're starting you can choose beyond that. So you're starting to recognize something like, I'm not necessarily like all these, you know, we have a certain thing that we connect to certain feelings and they're supposed to be wrong and we have to fix them. And what if it's all just awareness of what you are becoming aware of? Yeah, Yeah. can we go back to that thing about you have to fix them? Yeah. Because I think that that's a really big part of that chapter in the book. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he's talking about like, because if you don't recognize when someone is or isn't congruent, well, anyways, I mean, you'll try to fix them regardless, Mm -hmm. right? And that's like, you're putting your hand in the trap. And so it's, I think that there's a lot to be said for letting people suffer. (laughs) Yeah. Because a lot of people want to be congruent with suffering. They might say they don't. Yeah. But what speaks louder, words or actions? So what a lot of, a huge free freedom that I, this is one of the, my tricks of being free from like being always bogged down by people's stuff. Because I mean, I've spent so much of my life at the effect of and really stuck with trying to heal somebody, not being successful with healing somebody, like feeling like being rejected by that person that I really care about, being totally like devastated by watching some of the choices that some of the people that I cared about have chosen. Like I've spent so much of my life like that. And the one, this is just for those, if this works for some of you guys, the one thing that really has been my free all from that limitation has been the willingness to actually let people suffer I used to think that surely they wouldn't want to suffer surely if they knew it could be better they would you know make that choice I've never done to tell you it's (laughs) I'm here I'm here to tell you guys you know it's like not everybody actually wants to change be happy or be happy and that's true 
and even the people who, and this is like, there's the obvious ones, right? Like we all have those obvious people where they just continuously yeah. choose to destroy their lives. And like, we know we've sort of written them off. We're like, yeah, well, that person's, you know, who they are, they're doing what they're doing. Gotta let them go. But then there's like the people who like the, the sneaky ones who are either like our friends who started access with us or are the colleagues that we work with who are like, deeply working with access or having their own facilitation businesses and they aren't congruent. Those can be even the trickier ones because we assume well, like, well, since they're using access or since they're going to all these classes or since they're facilitating all these classes, like surely they must want to be honest with themselves. So that doesn't, that's not true either. What's true yeah. is that when somebody is honest with themselves, then they're congruent. Until somebody is honest with themselves, they won't be. And that's about as logical as that is. And I, and it's also this, like, the more, so what Shana is talking about is, like, it, it, you never get down. There's not one group that yeah. is congruent ah, and another group that's anywhere. not congruent. That's not yeah. how this works. Like, it's all different. So be, So if you're on this call, you are probably more congruent with yourself than 90% of the population on earth like that's that so you're already you're already moving in that direction and one of the things that Dane said in the very end of the chapter I'm just going to read one paragraph because I think it's such a like a key to who you are so be mindful that most people come to you to create a change based on the most limited version of what they think they can have they don't realize that they're living in a limited world where they, when they could live in an infinite world and you get to guide them there. You pop the bubble on the reduced reality they bought. And that comes from that being willing to actually be congruent, but also actually ask for congruency. You may not get it, <laughs> but by asking for it, by by having that as the ask in your life, they have to, you're actually opening up where they function just by requesting that, just by asking them that question, what else? What else? What's going on? And there's also a part there, if you work with bodies that I really love, where he talks about the open question, where you can, if somebody comes to you and you worked on their back the last time and you say, should we work on the on your back again? You're already closing down the possibilities instead of saying, hey, what should we work on today? Or what's up? Like Gary says. Yeah. Because that is such a different starting point for any session than if you already start at. So this is like how we energetically like work with expanding people's worlds even in that very moment, the first question. Um, yeah, it's so, it, it's interesting yeah, with this. It's just interesting talking. I, I, it's really actually difficult for me to have this conversation about other people. I can only really, I don't know that I've like been hugely successful in, no, that's not true. Actually, that's not true. Yeah, this is going to say you're not being super successful in facilitating. I think a lot of people on this call would, would facilitating say that facilitating other people to be more congruent, like to get yeah. to congruency, and it's totally not true. I have been successful in that way. Um, well, is where I'm, you're yeah. being congruent. So what you're being I am, is facilitation. I am sometimes and i'm always seeking for more congruency which is mm. so powerful it's so intense i almost wonder if congruency it's like i've i long ago discovered that most of the problems that humanoids have were boiled down to just the good they were all good excuses to not be powerful <laughs> you know like what if every problem you have is a reason and justification to not be potent you know yeah i can't because you know I'm pathetic. I can't because I don't have the money. I can't because my mom is mean to me. So when all those problems go away, in fact, okay, so, okay, so here we go. So what are the, so like, what are the primary things that you guys use to 
pull you out of congruency with yourself, you know, until we destroy oh. and create them all. Yes. Right, wrong, good, battle, nine, pud, puck, shirt, boys and beyonds. Ragwa has an interesting oh. question. Ooh. How come some people don't know and use any tools or aren't honest and have nothing to do with congruency yet they have everything in life and the rest of us keep working on things yet don't have much results. Who's, who's, who's asking that question? Pragwa. Pragwa, do you know that to be true for a fact or is that something you're imagining that they have everything that they want? That they want? You can unmute like, yourself. Do you live Pragwa. with them? Do you live with them and follow them around and take inventory of, <laughs> and note of everything that's going on in their lives? No, they're not getting everything they want in life. That is completely your projection and expectation. I mean, you mean the people you're seeing on Instagram who you think have perfect lives? You mean those people? <laughs> you're muted, Pragwa. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, no, I just know some of them in real life. Um, what I would basically say is that you might want to get more information become before you come to that statement of they're getting everything they want that might be projecting that really well i i also want to add something that i think i talked about in another call but um i've been noticing a lot of um like a lot of friends that i have from long before access are stepping into positions or jobs that I would have thought that I wanted when I went to school, like ambassador or like all these foreign service jobs, because I used to work in that world. And they are, you know, they're at the age now where they are peaking in their career. So they are peaking into these different jobs that I used to think that would be like, you know, the job that I would end up at or have. Um, so I was looking at that the other day, I'm like, would I want, would I swap my life today mm -hmm. for that? And mm -hmm. I, not for a zillion, godzillion mm -hmm. dollars or money or fame or anything. I, I cannot even imagine living that life today. So when you look comparing yourself with people and looking at they get everything what is everything and who defines what's everything and why mm. is that more valuable than what you're getting consciousness for example like where who's putting everything there and what where are you putting you and what you're getting so that comparison who dis, who decides it who defines it what's better and what's worse and what you desire so what do you truly desire, Pragwa, that you may never, ever even have considered? If you didn't have this reality to put your baseline and your reality, what would you request? What would you desire? What would you create if you went beyond that? That's interesting. I never thought it that way. Right. But that's, again, where it's kind of like what Shannon was saying, where we've been trained in the tools of this reality, which is logic, conclusion, and judgment. And we've never been trained in congruency questions. Or fact, che or fact checking. Or, for, or even fact checking, like real fact checking, not going to another source that comes from the same source in the beginning, you know? So thank you for asking that, Pragwa. Um, let me see if there was, so we got a few. Um, question, we had a question in the beginning that um, somebody was asking what the five elements of anger are. Is that relevant for this conversation, Shannon? I don't know if it's relevant for this conversation, but I think it's like some of the most relevant. I mean, it's, it's an aspect of information that has been one of the massive gifts of my life. Like if you're someone who suffers from anger, like if you're Irish at all, you probably need this information really badly. Go for it. Tell us the five. It's five. interesting too, because I don't know that this, maybe it exists in the reference materials and it maybe would have been in COP like many, many, many years ago, mm -hmm. but it isn't any longer. But it's, 
it's so this is a really essential information so anger is always one of five things and if you're somebody who has a lot of anger or is susceptible to anger um the reason you can never handle it is because you're not identifying what it actually is or what the source of it is so the five things that anger can be is number one a distractor implant so anger is oh, anger is one of the distractor implants number two it's because there's a lie so a humanoid will always be angry when there's a lie unless you acknowledge that there's a lie and there's incongruency then you won't get angry you'll just know what's true much more powerful position number three is it belongs to somebody else who does this belong to i pick up anger within like a hundred kilometer radius of me like all the time like it's i am i am like an anger magnet it's just one of my god-given gifts so that's something i have to be really aware of like if i was relaxed and then all of a sudden i'm furious i'm like oh what really angry person just walked by the house you know who does it belong to number four it's a potency that you're misidentifying so often we as humanoids can start to access more power and potency by for example by becoming more congruent with our with ourselves that will then start to access more power access more energy and we since we're not taught what true power is we tend to misidentify it as anger especially when we're really powerful as little kids and our parents are like stop being so angry so we misidentify that this energy is anger and then we forever misfire that understanding so number four is a misidentification and misapplication of potency and number five is when you're being when you're trying to control so mm. people use anger to control so whenever there's anger in my world i always run through that list and i hand it gets handled in a moment and then i go on to the next change and you know it is so relevant for this conversation once you start i'm like that is so relevant because okay oh, oh right because when you know what the anger yeah. is you're more congruent with what's true yes. when you're angry you're not being congruent with what's true T totally you lose it in a split second when you go to anger for any of these reasons yeah you yeah. lose your congruency cool. so it's yeah. so relevant <laughs> so amazing mm -hmm. thank you it was alban i thank you for asking that question it's been you know, busting in my head. Um. But this actually brings me on to this other amazing thing about, I mean, so if we're talking about congruency, which we are, um, knowing what anger is, those five elements has helped me become more congruent with that, what's actually going on. But then that even dovetails into the distractor implants because the distractor mm -hmm. implants are designed to literally take you out of congruency with what's true and put you into this internal loop of fear or um hate or anger or all these things that the distractor implants are so the distractor implants are this real like um stronghold of incongruency which is why it's yeah. so important i cannot emphasize enough how relevant it is to learn the distractor implants recognize when they are occurring in your own world and to learn how to run the processes to clear them and to look at what's underneath them i mean just yesterday my husband and i were traveling to france and he was in a horrible mood that kind of mood where you like want to get as far away from somebody as possible but we couldn't because we were in like a tiny plane and i was like okay i'm either going to i'm gonna die or he's gonna die or something has to change so finally i turned to him i'm like babe you are being what is going on i meant my wits end i'm like what you know i've tried a million other things and he's just what he is <laughs> finally i'm like babe okay we've got to do something this is so hardcore and he reluctantly he says well the kids are with my mom right now so my husband has two children i have two stepchildren and they're with their grandmother and my husband's mother is a whole pile of shit all into herself and as soon as he mentioned that the kids were with his mother, then the energy started to barely lighten up because he was starting to get congruent with what he was aware of that he wasn't acknowledging that he was aware of. So I kept on asking him questions and he finally goes, I just hate her so much. Like that's where he was stuck. He was stuck in the distraction of hate of his mom. And I went, you hate her? And he goes, yes. And I was like, is that true? He's silent for about 
60 seconds and he goes, whoa, I am aware of how much she hates herself. And it was the first time in his life that he became aware of her distractor implants and that they weren't his. And so we knew it was a distractor implant. We knew where the issue lied because he said the word hate. And when you learn the distractor implants, then you can identify in the vocabulary or in the way you think if there's a distractor implant that's the source of the issue. And I like, I, guys, like 75% of the time, like most of the issues that are, you're experiencing on a daily basis are distractor implant rooted. And, and I just want to point out too that it doesn't even have to be like a live living person. I sometimes have distractor implanted from like watching a TV series and something is going on in the series. And I find myself love, being really, really I concerned. Love. And I'm like, oh my God, that was in The Witcher. That's like, because I really love science fiction stuff. So I'm like, oh, it's actually not real. <laughs> I'm like super concerned, but it's not even from a real thing because we're so energetically aware that these little buttons that get pushed and used yeah, in exactly. any kind of movie or film actually also can get those going. So look, can I learn something? So all of the implants and explants that any and all of you guys designed, sold, or bought to perpetrate the ease of distraction Will you destroy and uncreate all that, including yes. all the shaky parts and pieces? Right and wrong, good and bad. Oh, wow, all my pop punk shirts for you, my eyes. Wow. Because Kat and I are all, Kat and I are also reading. Since we're doing like a body body whispering yeah. book club, I'm going to talk about another book that we're doing. A, we're Kat and I are doing a personal book club on yes. this work called this book called Deep Work. That's um not about consciousness at all, but it's about like well, well anyways, um, it talks a lot about how a lot in our this day and age, our society is very much built on distraction. If, even with our messaging system, how easy it is to watch, and how many of you guys can spend hours a day just handling messages and emails. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's this distraction from creating, like the, from putting in the time to create the work that does require uninterrupted focus. That's like what deep work is um, and what the book is about. But even if you look at consciousness as deep work or your awareness as deep work yeah. and the, the relevance. We'll put the, We'll put the book, um, the name of the book and the author, if you want to check it out in the, in your little. To be honest, like the body whispering book, like if you're going to really apply this stuff in this book, it is deep work. It's, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's a level of focus and commitment to, um, something that this reality will do its best to distract you from constantly. And just notice like those of you who have sometimes read the chapter before you go on and sometimes haven't and notice how much you can receive if you actually like that, just that commitment to reading the chapter before you come on. It's like taking going deeper. It it's so funny because in the beginning, when we started to do this <laughs> book club about deep work, I started to read this book. And I noticed how I continuously wanted to check my emails and my text messages and it, uh, how, which like, is like this external manifestation of how much in our heads are always going to check in with other people. What's that person doing? What's that person yeah. doing? going into the past about what we did yesterday that had absolutely no relevance to what can be created right now. And the, one of the coolest part about that was by not going to the wrongness and just noticing it. I'm like, oh, this mm. is actually going on for mm. me. I am actually distracting myself by thinking I have to check all these messages. And I, I'm distracting myself so much, I can't even read this book about deep work deeply. <laughs> I'm like, so by just noticing that, I could actually then make a different choice. And it, that reading that book in the book club we've been doing has actually been changing the whole way I work yeah. every day me too. since I started to read that book. And that doesn't come from that the book is like 
the new guru, it comes from, it brought to attention something that was going on for me and I can now make a different choice. And I, it's kind of like consciousness. It's like a continuous choice. It's not like, oh, now I'm going to do deep work. <laughs> it's like, now I will choose to start. And, and learning a new language is a form of deep work. It takes a huge amount of focus and neurological activity and energy to create new neural pathways to institute a new language. And mm. this language of awareness, which the Body Whispering book is a manual for, that learning that language might feel exhausting, intimidating, and overwhelming at times because it is a new language and it does require a lot of focus. And um, I guess the point being, especially on a section on the, in the chapter on congruency, it's um, so easy to be distracted mm. from what's true for you. And what if it's just as easy to be congruent with what's true for you? to where are you going to put that energy i love that that's beautiful what if it's as easy to be congruent as to not to be congruent what if it's actually easier to be yeah. congruent? and it is but that's just don't take my word for it <laughs> like i hope you find out for yourself yeah i think we're gonna i think beautiful. we're gonna end there thank you everyone Thanks. really amazing this was lovely to come on i'm so happy to see all of you guys here because i haven't really tuned I, you know it's just wonderful it's just so effing cool cat thank you so much for creating this and i mean you all know that cat like basically made that body whispering book happen like she's definitely that's why this woman has to do deep work because we have a lot of books to write and that takes some serious energy it does it actually does book writing is not shallow work so no it is yeah. not Cool. Thank you, everyone. I'm so grateful and have a wonderful, you know, whatever you're doing over the holidays, if you have holidays. Otherwise, let's get you something else. Guys. Guys.